All right. Good afternoon. We're starting our. Uh, actually, we're, we're waiting for people to log in at the beginning of our Zoom meeting. Here. So, making sure I've got all my screens in front of me. Feel free to put your name and the kind of car you have, if you have a car in the chat, or if there's a burning question that you have uh, that you'd hope we're gonna to answer tonight, that would be also of interest as well. I'm gonna control my screen here. Okay. Here we go, we're getting a lot more people. Oh, yeah. Is there a button there to invite them all? Or open them yeah, all I've up? opened the, the room for everybody. <clears throat> Good. <clears throat> you know, we schedule this meeting the same time as the basketball game, so. Uh-oh. <laughs> we'll see how dedicated people are. Is that the foot one or the bat one? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Every time I say that, my friends get so mad at me. They're like, how can you not watch sports? I'm like, I have things to do. <laughs> <It's> yeah. just... <laughs> Got another life. I have a website called I don't watch sports.com that I never built up, but um, yeah, it's basically gonna be kind of nonpartisan sports swag for events where you feel left out when you don't pick one team or the other just go team you know <laughs> okay we're just about six now maybe we want to wait uh, a couple more minutes Yeah, Richard, I think we should probably get started. Okay. Here we go. So we go to the next slide. Slide two. There we go. Okay, for you guys who are there, this is the Davis Electric Vehicle Association, our June 8 meeting. Thanks for joining us. I want to put in where <clears throat> our Meetings are supported by Cool Davis and also by help from SAC EV as well. Um, some house housekeeping items. Next slide. <clears throat> and if you could all remain on mute, keep your uh, keep your mics on mute so you can keep the chatter in the back. If you've got questions and issues, um, feel free to use that chat to present them. Um, and we'll have somebody. Chris Granger is here handling the, the technical side of things. We'll be looking at the, the uh, chat from time to time, as I will. Um, and then, oh, another reminder is we're recording this meeting. So if you don't want your image there, you can either turn the video off or you can change your name and then on the uh, title of the video. <clears throat> and let's go into the first slide. Okay, so welcome. Um, June meeting, we've made it to the middle of the year. Uh, just want to say we've got uh, for our topics for tonight, if you've seen, we're going to, as we always do, start with a little hot topics. But, but then we're going to do a, a, dis a discussion on dryer outlet splitters. And this kind of came out of uh, well we've talked about it before but uh, i think we've gotten some more information on this and it's based on a ev show we did this last weekend with the rancho yolo community senior community here and uh, they had many questions about charging and so um, this devices that they have now will be real interesting to talk about um, charging around davis so chris granger will do uh, uh the favorites for us and she's going to do um kind of 
identify for some of the new charging sites that have popped up in Davis. You know, in the last two years, there have been a number of fast chargers and uh, little two chargers, public chargers that have gone up. And because of our, you know, 2020, 2021 kind of less mobility, uh, a lot of them I haven't seen. So I actually told Chris it'd be interesting for me as well. And then finally, uh, funding opportunities for, for charging sites. Just a small item of what's available out there right now. So with that, uh, oh, and at the end, just to say, <clears throat> the best part too is at the end, we'll uh, always keep time at the end for question and answers regarding EVs, uh, which is kind of, you don't think of a hot topic, you think at the end, which I always do. Good time to bring it up and, and good time to really talk about what's, what's happening in the, in the near future for EVs. Okay, with that, Chris, why don't you go, uh, and I'll do the introduction to the first topic, which is hot topics. So next slide. Okay, so um, if anybody has any, any uh, recent EV news they want to uh, bring up, unmute yourself and go ahead and, and tell us about it. If you, if you've heard it, this is kind of a, a time to give us some short, short little details that they found out. Hi, uh, hello. My name is Susan Pelican. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. you can. I uh, am going tomorrow to a demonstration at the Capitol at 8.30 from the Center for Biological Diversity to encourage the Air Control Board to make regulations to make uh, all EVs, uh, only sell EVs anyway, uh, by 19 by 2030. And I'm wondering if anybody else knows about that or is planning to go. I know about it. I actually heard about it as well from SAC EV. And uh, I actually had planned to go. Uh, unfortunately, I've got some work coming over first thing in the morning, so I'm going to have to skip it. So I let them know I couldn't make it. But it sounds like they're bringing up their advanced clean cars regulation, which has the timing for introducing EVs. So Susan, that'd be great if you can go out there. And, uh, yeah, and then they encourage you to go to the hearing and talk. Yeah. If only for two minutes. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, and they have talking points, et cetera. So I encourage people to go. If they're free at 8.30 in the morning in Sacramento. Thanks, Susan. Hi. You know, if you can't make it in person, um, person would be better. I think it has much more contacts. So I'm glad you're going, Susie. Um, there's also a link. You can also go to the Air Resources Board and look on their board meetings, and you can actually do a, a webcast. And I'm sure there's somewhere there you can actually make a comment over Zoom. Yeah, um, good idea. So you can do that too. So I'm gonna Thank I'm you. gonna do that. So. All yeah. right. Thanks, Susan. All right. <laughs> Anybody else got any uh, hot topics they want to bring up? If you don't, that's your problem because I got a couple. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, never give me the floor. This is bad. No. Um, so, hey, recently, Richard, yes. can you uh, speak up just a little bit? Your voice is dropping off a little bit. I will do that. I'm using my uh, secondary mic here. How's that? Is it a little better? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Chevrolet on June 1st announced that for their 2023 models of the Chevy Bolt and the Bolt EUV, they're going to drop the prices on both models about $6,000. I think the I think the Bolt EV is going down like 5800 and the EUV is going down over $6,000. So that means that um, the base price of the Bolt which was about, you know, $31,000 maybe $32,000 is now going to be somewhere about 27,000 and the EUV which is at 33,000 will now drop down to about uh, almost 27,000 too. So I bet you the, the bolt is probably at 26 and one's at 27. So it almost makes them, you know, some of the cheapest EVs, um, electric vehicles you can get on the market and with a decent distance as well, a range of um, almost 260 miles for the bolt. And I think it's 247 for the bolt EV. So it's pretty interesting. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is since we last talked, we've had a couple of EV events in the events. One was on um, April 28th, which was Earth Day, uh, Drive Electric Earth Day. Um, we helped the Davis United Methodist Church. 
they wanted to put on as part, actually as one of their, one of their goals and missions for the church is taking care of the planet um, and God's creation. Um, and so as part of that, they wanted to do an EV show, um, an EV fair. So um, we helped, uh, actually we helped contact owners and we got about 11 different EVs out. Um, it was actually a pretty good affair. We had some of the, the newest models on the market right now, the Mustang Mach-E, the Nero EV, uh, EV6, the Hyundai, Hyundai um, Iona 5, Volkswagen ID4, all those models, um, which have all been hitting the market in early 2022 and uh, into 2021. And then we had the Bolt and we had the Leaf and quite a number of other models. So it was a great opportunity for people um, to go out there and take a look at the and ask questions. Um, so a pretty good turnout, had almost, what, 70 people come um, that's, I'm not sure that's counting even the quite a few uh, volunteers that we had to from both the church and from D that came out. Um, the second one was this last Saturday. We met with the uh, community at Rancho Yolo um, Mobile Home Park. So Rancho Yolo, I don't know if you know much about it. It's primarily kind of a senior citizen area. Uh, at least the residents are primarily senior citizen, senior citizen though not all of them. And we did kind of a combined show. We did a EV 101 Zoom meeting first and then broke for about an hour and a half. And then we actually had a little EV show as well that brought out about seven EVs for people to kind of look at. So we dealt with types of EVs and charging and used cars and what to look for in used cars. Um, I think the best part of this too was not our slide presentation, but the question and answer, the questions we got. And um, so the Rancho Yolo people are pretty new. So um, it was interesting. I heard a lot of questions that I probably had heard before I even got an EV, but um, a lot of them dealing with myths about why EVs don't work, which we were able to clarify. So anyway, that was another one of our outreach efforts for these community events. So, okay, that's all and I'll just, just okay. add to that, that we are, um, moving forward with this kind of outreach. Um, we do have our, you know, uh, National Drive Electric Week event where we have a big show and tell and ride and drive event uh, attached usually to the farmer's market. And we'll be doing that big event this year, again this year, but in between now and then we'll be continuing to do these smaller activities with, um, with local neighborhoods and churches and other organizations as they ask us um, and where they can do outreach to their membership and, um, and we bring the cars and the information to share. So, so if you have um, a, a community or an organization or a neighborhood group that you think would be interested in this, um, please let us know. Good. I think we've got a good model, as Chris said. <clears throat> um, oh, and then one last thing I want to add in here, just before I get to the next one, is if you'd like to volunteer with Diva a little bit more, we definitely need some extra help on our leadership board so you can bring in some fresh ideas. Um, so probably um, we're going to send out a note here probably at the beginning of next week, kind of like here's some of the roles you can play to help out. Um, and so we'd love to have more people join us. We've got a couple of people on our leadership group who've moved out of the area. And uh, so we can we'd love to get some more community input from you. So put that on your list and think about and then expect to see an email next week. Okay. So did you have something to say for us? Um, well, you know, some of the highlights of those, those uh, leadership jobs are um, folks who like to write and uh, help us with communications. Um, also, uh, we are looking for people who wouldn't mind being a part of our pop-up at the farmer's market team who might be willing to be the lead on site um, uh, with helping um, you know, once a month on a Saturday at farmer's market with um, uh, education um, with a single owner's vehicle on the, on the bricks. And um, so those are, those are a couple of uh, key things. And then we're also looking for people with a, um, some skill in technology because we're looking at going hybrid with our meetings in the future to do both Zoom and in-person. Uh, we don't know when that's going to happen yet, but um, uh, we're looking for people who are willing to 
be trained on the technology that we'll be using um, for that and help us with uh, that kind of thing um, in the, that um, in, in person hybrid mode. Great. Thanks for bringing that up, Chris. That was one of the things we have been talking about internally, um, but we need to talk to SAC EV. They've done it. They've actually had a couple of problems themselves. We need their input as well, but they really need somebody from Diva that wants to really help in and jump in with us. Good. Okay. First topic. So I'll introduce this by saying that one of the things that came out of our Rancho Yellow um, EV discussion, EV 101 discussion, um, and out of the, the show itself too, but one of the big things was home charging and how easy or difficult it might be. Now at Rancho Yellow, they had, you know, it's mobile homes primarily, but they have difficulty adding new um, um, capabilities of, of putting a, a sole EV charging rule on a line. In. So um, that's why the idea of maybe lowering the expense and making it for some communities easier to get into home charging would work out with these EV outlet splitters. So with that, I'm going to let Ash, um, Ash Dalal from, from Diva. And Ash, Ash, if you just jump right in. And you've got your own slides, right? Uh, no, I was going to maybe use yours if you have them loaded. Uh, I mean, we kind of keep it flowing a little easier, but um, I can, I have it up right now too. I can share a screen or whatever you feel like is easier. I can, well, if you give me one second, I can pop that open. Oh, we have a Rivian in the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who's that? Get his name <laughs> or her name. My advisor just uh, picked one up today, so I'm interested to see how his feedback is. But uh, yeah, I guess while uh, Robert is, uh, or I'm sorry, Richard is, uh, is uh, uh, loading up that presentation. Yeah, we had a really good session this last Saturday at the uh, Rancho Yolo and really kind of put perspective on how we can live with EVs on a day to day basis when you are in a residential area that is um, either single family or even multifamily dwellings. And in this case, uh, in a uh, mobile home park where you may have some limited resources where you would traditionally charge. And so it's a good perspective on, uh, on that, but also introducing a lot of this technology to new folks. Um, one of the big questions that came above that event was, you know, how do we charge? You know, so the first thing we did was really survey what utilities are available to most of the residents there as well as other locations. And most of those are limited to your traditional 120 outlet, the regular three prong plug that you're used to plugging in your regular accessories with. And that can only give you, you know, level one charge that can take pretty long time when you have a lot of these really large battery capacity vehicles, you know, like the Rivian or even the Teslas and such, you know, so um, in order to reduce that time, the 208 level two charging systems are more popular, but now you have to kind of see if your house is equipped with that, but also you may have to share that uh, that outlet with whatever's already plugged in there, which may be uh, like a, a clothes dryer or you know some other appliance of some sort. So the question came up is like, well, I've got a battery dense car, you know, and I've got this you know need to charge it much faster without you know DC fast charging. How do I do this when I have only one outlet to share with a dryer? So one of the other uh, uh, members of the team, um, Eugene, gave us an idea of a unit called a splitter. And if you want to move to the uh, next slide, we got a couple of examples here. And these are great little tools here that can share the load between what is currently occupying that outlet, which in this case is a dryer, uh, with your EVSC that's used to charge your vehicle. So basically, it's sort of a gatekeeper of sorts to, to allow one to work versus the others, where you don't have to physically disconnect and reconnect each time you use it. So for instance, let's say your grandkid comes along and with after a baseball meet and messes up his pants and you need to wash him again, but you have an EV charging, you don't have to now separate that charger outlet and replug in your dryer. You can simply do this with this unit actually managing that distribution of power. So it would basically cut off your vehicle charge and then continue on with your dryer use. And once your dryer use is done, we'll kind of switch back to, you know, your EV charging. So it will extend that time to charge, but you can share that outlet dependency with another appliance, which is a great way to integrate 
technology like this into your house without the concern of physically crawling behind, you know, uh, your wall to, to access that outlet where all the spiders and bugs are and stuff. So um, really cool may, uh, way of doing this. But now there's a couple of different options on the market right now that can handle this, um, including this one option over here called the Dryer Buddy. And they basically have the same strategy where it has a active monitoring of both of those outlets to see what load is, is present and then applying that, uh, that power to that unit when needed, but then shuffling whenever you have the demand for something else. So in this case, your EVSE and dryer are both sharing the same outlet, but whatever is on first will get that power and whatever um, you connect afterwards will then distribute accordingly. And so and there's programmable methods on this too to make this um, you know, a little bit more uh, useful for you. So for instance, if you are planning on uh, using your dryer at a specific moment of the day or planning your vehicle charge at a certain moment of the day, you can also manage that throughput through some of these devices here. So this is one of the examples here. And I think there's a few others in uh, the remaining slides that we can take a look at, but essentially they are all the same in terms of overall function. It's just, um, you know, the uh, uh, kind of the form factor is the only thing that's really different. So in this case, that one was a larger unit that, you know, hung from the wall, but this one looks like it's more of a, uh, like a floor platform sort of sort uh, unit that, you know, still connects to the main outlet and still has the two outlets to connect to for your EVSC and your dryer. And so again, just a clever way to, to manage both of those loads uh, when, when you only have one available. Of course, the secondary option is to have a custom outlet put in and of course, once you talk to your utilities to see if there is some special tier or some special rate that you can uh, get for your EV charging, that would really be one way to isolate that, uh, that cost. But in this case, if you are sharing the dependency and wanna reduce that overall cost uh, to install that, this is a great option. And so um, this is uh, another unit here. So this is um, a, what is it? The, the EVSC. So it has the direct connection to your vehicle, but using that same uh, NEMA 1030 uh, outlet there. So the common three prong plug for, for 208, 240 service here. Yeah, the one thing I thought about this was it was much less expensive than, bu than buying some of these EVSCs that you have hanging on the walls. So for someone who, who didn't have a lot of room, this seems like a great, great option. Just and it, Again, though, you had to have an open dryer receptacle. So you just had to plug that in. And remember also, if you do have the access to only level one, I don't believe there's very many products on the market to support level one charging uh, distribution like this, uh, Richard. I don't know if you've seen any, but I, I personally haven't seen any, uh, but I'm sure they exist. But uh, either way, same intentions where you can now share that load. But keep in mind also that most 120 outlets are very low uh, breaker values. And so they can only maybe get 12 amps out of it, which means you're extending that charge time considerably. So um, if you do uh, have access to only one 120 outlet, just make sure that it isn't shared with anything else uh, in that circuit. For instance, in the garage, you may have your lights and some other accessories, you know, on that same circuit where the minute you plug in a car charger, everything trips and now everything's shut off. Um, so that's, again, one thing to survey in your property. But if you do have access to a 240 outlet that's shared with a dryer, these are, again, great options for uh, energy management. Go on to the next one. There's a little lag in my screen changing. Ooh, come on, you can do it. It's <laughs> in here. I guess in the meantime, uh, if there's any questions uh, or any any kind of uh, feedback on these units or if anybody has had exposure or experience with these things. Richard, you might be able to unshare and then share again. Yeah. Okay, here's the next one. I'll just do it in non-slideshow um, mode. Yeah, so this unit over here is exactly another another form factor, same intentions, but now instead of kind of a face connection you have on the side. So if you have uh, space constraints, let's say behind an existing dryer of sorts, you can now plug it in without spreading everything too far from your wall or, you know, respacing things to, to, to match 
um, you know, the spacing behind the, that outlet. So again, multiple different ways of doing the same thing, but uh, different form factors in this case, which uh, might be a little bit more forgiving in your application. You know, the one thing I like about this is just uh, um, just a small little box. It's got smart switching and safety devices, so it doesn't overload the circuit. And it's just this little cube that just plugs into that dryer outlet. And then it has two receptacles on both sides. One's the primary, which is usually the dryer, and the secondary is the easy charger. So um, it's, uh, it just seems to me like a little handle, handy thing. Um, one of the things they advertised was not only could you use this for using it that's on your dryer circuit, but if you had a 240 line, you could use this for charging two different EVs at the same time. You'd have you know, two different chargers, you'd plug them in, um, starting to charge the primary would go first when that one's completed charging, it slips, it switches over to the second EV. So, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And I tell you the price on these, um, Remember what the prices? I think they were like some of these, they were all about $350, something like that. Which, you know, considering what you might have to do, a couple of things. One is getting electricians typically pretty expensive. Um, but the other thing is it, you know, it completely avoids the need for bringing anybody in to do that and for getting a permit. So, um, not that I'm, so it, it actually is a kind of an easy way to. Um, you know, if your house has a 240 line for a electric dryer, you can quickly make it available for a, a EV charging port at the same time. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think this was, and the reason we kind of looked at this too was the yellow, Rancho Yellow people, um, just because of the, the, the makeup of their network itself, their electrical network on site, it was very difficult for them to add, especially if a large number of people had EVs. At the present time, I think there's only about three or four people that have EVs there, but you know, to add them to their individual mobile homes out there, um, I think it got to be pretty limited pretty quick. Isn't that what you found out too, Ash, when you were there? Um, can't remember. Um... I, think he, I think he said there was a certain maximum. Anyway, this is the manager, yeah. so it's kind of a maximum. So they actually, they had actually started at one time looking for funding to put in a bank of level two chargers. And we kind of covered these kind of splitters with them. It meant that all the mobile homes there had a 240 line for a dryer that they immediately could just use that. So it, it, it eliminated the need to have to go for this bigger, a bigger bank of chargers. Okay, that's it. Let me stop the share. And Chris, you want to go put yours back up? Did you want to ask if anybody had questions? Oh, yeah, good. Any questions or feedback? Anybody had experience with these units? Well, if anybody has any questions, uh, definitely use the chat function there. Um, and I'll keep my email address handy there as well, oh, too, so you guys have looks, specific. Looks like Stephen has his hand up. Oh, go yeah. ahead, Stephen. Uh, yes, uh, my dryer is, uh, I think, separated from the, where the car would be uh, by a garage. And I don't think, I don't know if there's where the dryer port is, but I think he's probably close to the dryer. What kind of cord do you, uh, would you get with one of these uh, EV splitters? So the EV splitter would connect directly to the wall. And I think the cord in this sense would basically be your EVSC. So the actual unit that connects to that coupler, you can actually get in various lengths. So I think Clipper Creek, for instance, has like a 10 foot, 25 foot, 30 foot. Okay. Uh, so that would be your extension cord in this case that would connect to that, that device. And those are available in various lengths. And so um, if you look at uh, those manufacturers, make sure that whatever you do purchase at an extended length has that UL listing on the back or it has that testing. And you'll see a big kind of price difference between ones that are and ones that aren't. But in the case where you have bulk charging overnight or let's say uh, during the day, whatever the time is, and you have 50 feet of cable, that cable could get pretty hot. So make sure that that UL listing has all of that testing and everything else done in place. 
again, you might see a little bit of a cost differential, but again, that'll compromise for that, that large cable length if you have to go beyond you know, 25 or 30 feet. Great, thank you. Uh, I see a question in the uh, chat from Masse. Is that how I did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Did you, did you want to go ahead and ask your own question? Or I can. Um, uh, so the, the question was, uh, are these smart units like Wi-Fi capable and maybe even cloud connected to do utility demand management? I uh, surveyed a few of the makes and I know they have some options that at least give you access through Bluetooth for like your phone and things, but I'm not quite sure if they've gotten to the capability of doing any sort of load management per se. And I know there's other products on the market that do that, uh, but that might be kind of an additional item to the splitter, but I'm not sure again, if these particular units have that, you might have to look at those websites again to see I didn't look in their available options. I know they had different scalable ones from the basic to the more comprehensive ones. Uh, option wise on the more comprehensive ones, you may find at least uh, some feedback through an app or something, but most of them might have even Wi-Fi connections. There. So it might be worthwhile to take a look at the website and see what options are there. But I, I know there's probably something on the market that exists that either is that unit itself or another product to buy to, to accompany that. Terrific. Thanks, Ash. Okay, I don't see any other questions, Richard. Okay. So uh, next, Chris, I'm gonna ask you to share your screen and uh, talk about charging around Davis, sites for charging in Davis. Oh, too many things up at the moment. Hang on a second here. Okay, so I thought we would um, kind of spend a little time just talking about the status of charging around our town. And um, I wanted to do this because uh, some of you probably have, you know, are very aware of all the tools that are out there to figure out um, where you charging devices are available in our region or when you're on long trips. Um, but a lot of people in our community um, who charge at home um, and uh, do mostly commuting, and they, they sort of look outside the community, but they're not really paying attention uh, about what's inside the community. And then a number of the people that are, don't have electric vehicles are really not aware of how much um, public charging is available in Davis in our region. And so I really kind of want to give the DIVA group some more tools to be able to talk about what's available here and beyond here, because what's available in our community is an example of what's happening all over California, especially. Um, so um, I thought I would start with um, a look at uh, the Plug Share app, which I hope all of you are familiar with, which is um, uh, a um, online service that you can put on your phone um, and you can use on your home computer. Um, and you just go to plugshare.com and it provides all kinds of information about location and pricing and even the status, like if there's eight devices available and two of them are being used, it will tell you that if they're smart devices. So um, and when you're out um, on the road, it's very, it can be very helpful in terms of figuring out where you can go to charge. On this map, the green emblems represent level two charging that um, is um, uh, charging for uh, longer dwell times, um, but it's higher than just, um, it's you know the equivalent of the uh, 240 at home. Um, and um, so you can get a pretty significant charge on your car over several hours. The orange um, emblems represent um, fast chargers. And um, so 
those fast chargers um, are higher speed chargers that are available on for now almost all vehicles are um, capable of taking those fast charges. And one of the things that's been happening over the last several years has been the implementation of charging, fast charging along all of our major corridors in California. Um, and so now we're starting to see that show up in our own community and along um, all of the corridors that you might be interested in driving. So just I want to uh, zero in a little bit more on, on Davis. This is a picture of what's on the PlugShare um, app as of today. Um, you can see those um, fast chargers and also the number of level twos um, and their distribution around our community. You can see how close they are, many of them, to the chart to the I-80 corridor. Um, and a lot of the um, of the level two chargers have been placed as kind of strategically more recently, as well as our, our fast chargers um, by um, collaborations between um, uh, the, business, the device businesses that are um, putting devices out in the community and businesses that are interested in having those devices on site because they benefit from having those cars um, in their parking lots. So what I'm going to do is uh, just do a quick tour around town uh, to show you where uh, the majority of our uh, charging. Um, and I'm starting with the, the parts of town that have the highest amount of distribution. So in South Davis, um, I'll, do, I'll do a quick look back. So South Davis uh, here on this map is represented by um, those uh, um, uh, uh, those items that are along the high, the I-80 corridor, they look they're cut, like they're kind of slipping over on the map. And um, so uh, I'll start with the new bank of um, Tesla uh, fast chargers. There are 16 stations on the backside of the Oakshade Plaza in South Davis, you know, back behind uh, Safeway. And um, uh, those are available to uh, Tesla owners. Um, but one of the things that's happening with Tesla is that they are um, uh, working on um, opening up um, a portion of their charging devices to make them available to the general public. Um, and, um, and so we're anticipating that that's going to be start. We will we'll see that in our own community and other places where existing Tesla charger banks are. Um, there's a longstanding uh, set of devices uh, that's over on that left hand side mid. Um, that have been in place at the Air District office for um, quite a while um, now, and they make those available for their own fleet and uh, people who are there at their offices um, to work. Uh, the Hyatt Hotel, which is one of our newest hotels um, uh, down on uh, Childs Road, um, is, uh, has a uh, level two um, at its uh, location for uh, guests. And this is one of the newest things that we're seeing is that a lot of device um, um, providers are partnering with hotel chains all over the country to install um, uh, level two and, um, and also fast charging devices. So um, it's one of those things to start to pay attention to um, in terms of those hotel networks. Um, local businesses um, and organizations like Davis Diamonds have opted in on having a level two as well. Um, and they're providing their there is a, their device is actually free to, um, for use for their um, guests on site. Um, the 7-Eleven gas station on Mace Boulevard um, now has a DC um, fast charger um, uh, that is a uh, charge point. Um, and that's the one that you can see the 7-Eleven sign on it. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, we're seeing we're starting to see these pop up everywhere. McDonald's um, is partnering with Blink um, all over the state and maybe beyond. And um, you're starting to see, uh, we have uh, uh, level two um, uh, stations there right now, but I'm anticipating that we might, um, uh, there may be some uh, DC fast coming. Um, and then in uh, South Davis, there's also UC Davis is, and you'll see this later in the slide pres uh, presentation, UC Davis is making uh, charging available in all of their locations, um, many locations on campus, and then their off-campus locations as well. Um, so they at least have one device 
in every single one of their locations where they have uh, control of the property. Um, and then finally, the Kaiser Clinic um, in South Davis has um, installed uh, quite a few. Um, and uh, they have seven stations there, uh, both for their employees and their um, uh, uh, participants or members um, to use. So in downtown Davis, this is another place where we have quite a lot of charging. Um, we have a lot of what I would call um, uh, legacy charging in downtown. Um, and you'll see that under that uh, bullets uh, titled City of Davis. And um, so City Hall um, has uh, some even level one charging and uh, several level two chargers. In East Street Plaza, there's a level two charger. In the Fourth Street Garage, there's a level two charger. At the Amtrak station, we also have a, a level two charger. And the city in its current planning is planning on upgrades in all of those locations um, as a part um, of their, uh, the SACOG grant that they are currently um, implementing. So stay tuned for details about what that's gonna look like. But other places downtown, we know that there's at least one hotel that is working on um, installation. I don't think it's happened yet because it's not, it hasn't popped up on the um, plug share um, app. Um, but Bank of America um, had installed uh, in partnership with Electrify America, uh, seven, uh, four stations with seven plugs um, in their downtown parking lot um, in the last year. And then um, in, uh, at Davis Commons, we've had there for, for several years, um, a two plugged um, DC fast uh, station or two stations there and also some, a level two as well. So now I'm going to go to East Davis. So uh, this is kind of interesting. Um, and you know, the city for a while has, uh, for quite a while actually has been asking in its development agreements to, for the, uh, to be EV ready and to uh, install in some places to actually install chargers. So uh, chargers were installed in the Target Shopping Center area um, when uh, that uh, development agreement was made. Um, and there's a Bank of America on the, across the street from Target that also has um, uh, level, uh, some level two charge point chargers there as well. So the combination is um, nine stations and 18 plugs just in that whole area, uh, which is, um, uh, I know it's, it's one of those places where people, they're jumping off the highway beyond their last gasp. <laughs> coming home on their commute, often use the target area to recharge before they even head home. Um, the new residence in on the corner of 2nd and Mace Boulevard has um, installed uh, level twos. And again, uh, was a part of their development agreement with the city. Um, and um, uh, now um, under most, uh, most kinds of, um, of new construction and implementation, uh, most, uh, businesses like this would be required to install um, level two charging at least. Wild Horse Golf Course um, has had a level two charger for quite a while and they just upgraded it about a year and a half ago to a new device because their old device had broken down and wasn't working anymore. Um, the UC, as I mentioned, UC when it's um, outside of the campus, all of their sites have um, at least a, a one uh, level two uh, device. Um, and um, we have a couple of new ones uh, the Creekside Apartments, um, that's a development that was um, uh, partially the land was uh, donated to the city for, uh, and, and that Creekside Apartments serve um, disabled and um, uh, low income households. And they have um, uh, installed a uh, device there as well. And then finally, the DMV has a new, um, uh, solar storage beam system. Um, and I'd be curious to hear if anybody is familiar with this system um, where they're actually um, uh, storing power from uh, solar panels and then using that power as part of the charging um, system. Let's see. Uh, UC Davis, um, these are all the places on the UC Davis um, where there are level two devices. Um, what's interesting to me is, um, um, and maybe Katrina might know more about this or not, um, 
uh, but uh, that uh, there was a moment where there was at least one DC fast charger on campus. And um, I'm, I'm curious about whether they'll be installing um, any of those in the future, what the plans are. We don't, we don't have a, a sense of what is exactly happening um, at uh, UC Davis at the moment, but they have um, built out all of their planned level two. Um, uh, and, um, and now I think they're starting to think about um, a much more diversified uh, smart system for uh, new devices as they come online. Um, so when we get to other parts of town, um, whether we're talking Central Davis, you know, north of downtown, um, and uh, uh, and uh, West Davis, um, uh, what we what we find is almost a what I would call an EV charging desert, <laughs> and um, and so when we start to look at places where um, we might want to encourage um, both the business owners, the property managers. And, um, and uh, you know, sort of major employers to start thinking about getting um, charging installed. Um, and also, and we're looking at funding that the city might pursue, um, uh, making sure that we have uh, charging in um, key parking lots and key uh, city centers like our, our, like Central Park of the Library, the high school, um, and uh, our schools and some of our other park areas um, are all things that we um, can think about uh, and encourage um, in the future. Um, so again, um, that's uh, you know just looking back at the map. Um, uh, the what's what we have um, moving forward is you know the effort to upgrade and do some planning around old sites um, and addressing employee EV and fleet charging um, uh, for the city and for other large employers in the city. Um, we need to plan a few new fast charge sites so that we have fast charging available in all of the sectors of our city and, um, and especially up um, on that 113 corridor, we have nothing um, up uh, there uh, mm. at Covell and um, uh, 113. And, um, and then um, working to support and incentivize charging in workplace and public centers. Um, and again, I think EV owners asking for charging like the, the favorite places that you go to shop or places that you work are great place moments and places to ask about uh, what's the plan for installing uh, charging. Um, and so um, I just uh, want to encourage you to um, to get involved in uh, if you're interested in the, in get how we uh, promote charging in the community, you can join us um, uh, in the leadership team because um, we're trying to form a what we're calling a a charging strike team to assist businesses and others to um, uh, get this done and get charging installed. And, um, but we also, um, please uh, don't forget to join us for some of our future ride and drive events. And of course, bring all your EV curious friends with you. So thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. So um, I'm so glad you put that on because there's so many sites you talked about that I had no idea were there, like the uh, Bank of America at Target. Um, I must have gone past that place, you know, I can't tell you how many times in the last year. It never even worked. Um, I kept thinking, boy, this would be a nice place for charging. Um, so anybody have questions for Chris? Now that she's taking this tour around town? So Katrina, I saw your comment about UC Davis. No plans for DC fast charging. So... I haven't heard of any. Um, I know the reason. So the Mandavi Center, so that picture that Chris had up um, that used to have a, I think it was just one 50 kilowatt Chatamo charger. Um, and the reason they took that out was I heard because it wasn't working. Uh, it had some overheating <laughs> problems, uh, which is, you know, a fairly straightforward reason to remove it. Um, and so instead they were able to stick in, you know, more charging stations at lower power because, you know, 50 kilowatts versus a bunch of six kilowatt chargers is the kind of the power matrix works out better. And then they keep keep adding more, which I love. Um, but I don't know if they have any plans either about the smart charging aspect of things. Cause right now they're all, um, they're all Clipper Creeks, which are not smart. Um, they're just, you know, kind of chilling. Um, and the way they, they, um, so I think there's a few charge points. There's a handful of charge points, but the way they, um, kind of work around that is that if you buy a C permit, 
or an A permit, I think. So the, if you're a student or a staff member, you have to pay an additional 10 bucks a month on top of your parking permit to get like access to the charging stations. Um, I'm not sure how that works in practice because I never purchased a C or an A permit on campus, but um, that's what I've heard. But I mean, if it's, if uh, it's off after hours or, you know, if you're not paying for parking, you know, on the weekends, go wild. Um, this is graduation weekend, I think. So I would not go near campus. I would not be in Davis. <laughs> I would actively avoid, you know, leaving the house, but um, I don't, yeah, that's what I, my opinion is, is there's going to be a ton of people, a ton of drivers who don't drive in Davis, you know, just the whole enchilada of stay home or go away. <laughs> yeah. I'm always amazed that UC hasn't done more for some of these. Um, I, I charging. do think, you know, one of the things about electric vehicles, when you look at um, uh, the sort of staffing in institutions around, um, it, there's nobody sort of in charge. And, and it's, you know, I think it hasn't found its way. It's found its way into like, uh, you know, the fleet manager's responsibility or Unitrans in its electrification of its buses. But um, it's a, it's one of, it's a, it's a TAPS person um, who's responsible for doing this, but it's like one of many hats they wear and it sort of gets lost in, um, it's my impression that it gets lost in the planning. And then they also are often pursuing grant funding, which sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. Uh, John? So Chris, in your wanderings, did you get an, uh, a sense of the fraction that are open to the public and the fraction that are kind of tied down to uh, membership, like the Kaiser is only for Kaiser members, things like that? Well, it's very interesting because the, my impression is with, uh, and you can see this in PlugShare. So if you go and you click on the PlugShare information, it tells you um, and uh, what, what the device does and how much it costs. And so those devices at, at, um, um, at Kaiser are, are pay per use. Um, and so uh, I, I assume that nobody's out there policing whether or not you are affiliated with Kaiser. Um, and uh, uh, which is different than some places where there's actual locks you know, like there's, these are um, Clipper Creek uh, or even uh, charge point devices, but they are dumb devices. And um, so where they say they're not, they're not connected, um, they're often, um, those are either free or they are um, protected, locked down, um, and you can't use them. Uh, and so I would say, you know, those individual devices in in sort of private settings, you, you have to just look closely to see um, if they have any stated policy. Um, so there can be signage that says this is, um, you know, the private, um, um, this is only for guests and, um, or it can say it, this is public and available to use by anybody. On that point also, Chris, did you, so I know the the Kaiser stations in particular, those are networked not through ChargePoint, through uh, someone else. And I very rarely have ever seen anybody charge at those. Not I didn't think because it was uh, Kaiser only, which again, I agree. I don't know how you like meter that, but also because I just heard those are like incredibly expensive. Uh, and so they're kind of self-selecting against or for I don't know. They're self-selecting. So people who don't want to pay like an outrageous amount of money to charge will not. And so the people who are, you know, obviously paying for that. Um, but with the amount of charging stations around um, with different costs. Yeah. Uh, so they are um, a, uh, you know, a different, they're from the Sema Connect, which I yeah. have never even heard of them. Sema, yeah. And, um, and they're $1.35 per hour um, for charging. And so Yes, that's more expensive than um, most um, charging situations. I do wonder about whether uh, they don't appear to be smart enough, though, for it to be employee oriented, but I could be wrong. 
Um, um, so I actually know a little bit about SEMA Connect Chargers. If you want to go on this tangent, we can go down this rabbit hole. But um, essentially, they actually do some really interesting things in the MUD space as well for apartments. So you can actually lock them down. So um, you can, I have a SEMA Connect card. And so what you can do on the back end is you can say, oh, um, I have an invite code to this specific charging location. And so only accounts that are, you know, have access to that specific one, um, you can actually, it'll actually unlock for you. So they are actually fairly smart. Um, I've never done that before. Um, ChargePoint also has a similar thing as well. Um, anecdotally, um, well, anecdotally, my brother's office in Fremont, um, they have charge points, but in order for him to use his charge point card, he had to go like talk to five different people in HR to like let him onto their network to get in. Um, so like his charge point card works on their stations regardless of the vehicle. But if I were to tap my charge point card against those stations uh, at his work, it would not work. Um, so SEMA actually, they might, they can change the rates too. So depending on if you're like a member of their Kaiser network, they could make it more or less expensive, for example, um, which is I assume what they do. I don't know. I agree. I haven't charged there because it's money. It'd be really interesting to get a little more information because I, I think having some different models of different kinds of systems and how they work as an example for the different businesses who might be considering like they want to make it available for their customers, but they don't want to pay for their customers use, but they do want to provide it free maybe for their employees as a benefit you know, being able to have different different users and price them differently is a really important thing to do in workplace charging, so. I will talk at length with you about that, but I don't want to derail the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else with any other questions? Um, uh, I think it's fun uh, to um, point these things out when you're driving around town with people who don't have electric vehicles and say, look at that, there's another one. And, you know, 7-Eleven, Bank of America, they're partnering with these charging device uh, folks all over the place, which, which means how many 7-Elevens are there in California? Um, how many Bank of Americas? So those are the, the kinds of things we, we need to sort of reinforce with people that um, this, this charging network is getting stronger and stronger and becoming way more ubiquitous everywhere, at least in our own state and, and in those, uh, those corridors uh, as we move across country and um, across uh, state lines. And on that note that we had a great story at our last April meeting from one of our members who told the story of driving across, across country with their Tesla Y and that story is on our website and the video is available for people to watch, so. Yes, the best part of that was their efficiency for driving across, back and forth across the country. I was amazed in their Tesla. Well, they had a Tesla Y, so it's just mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And it was Julie Haney, right? And she goes, her husband says, what, what kind of speed did we average? And she goes, what was it? It was like 78 miles an hour for average speed going across. So that was most of those Midwestern areas where there's nobody there. But I think, and I think they're, you know, the miles per kilowatt, it was, um, it was amazing. It was amazingly high. It was like over four or something like that, right? Four miles per kilowatt. It's um, something like that. So it must be the, I'm not promoting Teslas, but I was amazed at home. So, and, yeah. and her, her, her partner being a, energy geek uh, put together all the data um, yeah, uh, to uh, look at uh, the cost and the greenhouse gas value of all their energy use going across country. So it was That's pretty fascinating his whole, presentation. You put his whole spreadsheet up so you can see exactly what, right. uh, what, what was the best mode and best speeds, everything. Yeah. Right, and what, it, what does it mean when you're driving on coal <laughs> versus yeah. driving on uh, natural gas or um, some other kinds of, uh, or in states where more renewable energy is uh, yeah. available. So. That was good. Great. Thanks, Chris. That was actually, it was, I guess, started to say um, before you even showed these things was, uh, you know, it's like there's so much that's gone on and I tend not to look for EV, park, uh, EV charging now because I live at home, but uh, I'm amazed how available it is. Out there, so, um, but we need more. Sorry. Okay. Because there are more cars. Hopefully, so. we'll get a lot more cars. Yeah. Okay. Are there so. any other questions? 
Great. If you do, you can bring them at the very end. So. Okay. Do you want to go to our last slide? Which the next item is going to be very short. Katrina Bonner chats. Um, so um, while I wait for uh, Chris to throw it up there. So uh, Eugene Dunlap, actually. Um, so he lives in um, Muir Commons up in northern, the northern days. And several years ago, he um, worked with pg &E to put in a, a bank of chargers for his little community area there. Um, a number of uh, different homes and uh, in fact, I haven't gone to that area, I guess maybe townhomes. Um, so um, I asked him if he, he couldn't make tonight's meeting. So I asked him to give me a little light up on what it was. And partly this is because pg &E still has funding for setting up EV chargers. Um, they're not really um, at home. These are more for actually commercial EV charging. And um, one of the minimums was it had to have four units per site. Um, so you can said that actually caused a little bit of a, um, just that requirement caused a lot of the original plans that people put them on hold um, for some commercial areas. But if you have interest in that, um, the funding's still there, pg e will cover it. That uh, pg e will cover the cost of infrastructure and the power to get to the site. Um, so that's going to be fully covered by pg e um, and then um, you have to work with another co company that then would provide the fast charging itself and equipment for that on site. Um, and then uh, he also wanted me to pass on that L2 and multi unit density parking cycle that's being renewed and um, more funds for that will be available as well. Um, in that case, there's a minimum of 10 units that are going to be required. Um, as part of that. And, you know, I'm trying to look through here is to find out if that's P coming from PG&E. Um, I'm just reading from his note here. And, uh, but if you're interested, if you have a commercial property and you want to put something in, if you've got a, you know, a multi-unit dwelling, apartment building, or even a you know, big apartment dwelling, that you want to put this in, you should contact Eugene Dunlap. Um, in fact, maybe the best way, what's the best way to do that? Um, I'd say we'll just send us a note at diva at cooldavis.org um, and um, uh, we'll get you in touch with the people that are working on this. Yeah. And so uh, Eugene found out about it because he, he'd actually had a little demo out there, I think about a month and a half ago, but he had a pg e engineer come by to come and fix some of the equipment. And that's when he told him about, hey, the funding, funding's still there, um, but, but come and get it quick. So anyway. Uh, that's all I wanted to say about that one piece. Uh, I think, um, as I was mentioning earlier, um, there is uh, um, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, our local businesses um, and property owners and property managers are, are responsive to their customers. And so it's also something that you can share, you can ask, um, you know, when, when is there going to be EV charging? You know, in this parking lot, and oh, I, I understand there's money available right now to get it done. So those kinds of things, if you if you know people who are in leadership or who are owners of um, uh, buildings and parking lots and um, different parts of our uh, community, um, uh, we you can have an impact that way by sharing information that may, they just may not know. I, that's a good point, Chris, because you know, to them it's an expense, but if they know people are coming in. And they'll find a parking spot in which they can charge um, and spend time in their stores um, or in their shopping area. I think they'd be much more open to bring in more customers. But, okay. So that's all we've got for tonight. But it's a good time for if we've got any questions from anybody out there they'd like to bring up. Um, this is especially if you have questions about what's on the market right now or what something you've heard about electric vehicles that you'd like some clarification about. 
Um, oh, John, I see that you have your hand in the air. John Bornstad. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm. Um, uh, I acquired an electric vehicle in uh, 2014, uh, BMW i3, uh, and last year I got a VW ID4. So um, I was feeling very uh, uh, proud that I was an early adopter. Uh, however, um, just last week. I was walking by a um, little free library and I found this book, Life with, with an Electric Car by Noel Perrin. It was published in 1992 wow. and a second edition in 1994. And um, he, lives, he lived in Vermont and he found an electric car company in Santa Rosa so he flew to Santa Rosa, uh, picked up his electric car, and drove it back to Vermont, um, charging along the way. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, haven't read the, I haven't read it yet, but when I do, I will, I will publish or write a uh, book report for everyone to read. <laughs> That'd be great. great. We'd, we'd love to... To include that, you know, we have a, a blog based a newsletter for Cool Davis, and that's where we, we cover interesting stories. And so, um, if yeah. you're we interested in sharing that in that way, we would be glad to publish it too. I'll certainly do that. Uh, so, I consider myself an early adopter, but my goodness, 1992. How about that. And I'll bet that's a, it, it, one of those very adventurous charging stories across country. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure it was. Yeah. Uh, one of the reviews on the back it says, um, "This book ambles along like an eco techies on the road, filled with chance encounters with electric car buffs and parents' funny misadventures." So, uh, sounds like a great read. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so, John, what kind of a vehicle did we have? I have a Volkswagen ID4. Yeah, what, what did he have? The guy in what did he have? Too. Yeah, um, it was one made in Santa Rosa. What was the name of it? Uh, I'm not sure what. Let's see. He was a professor at Dartmouth College and he found a, a company, I think Solar Electric or something like that, in Santa Rosa. Yeah. He, you know, he affixed a solar panel on top of his car, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. It had to have been lead-acid batteries at the time, probably way. I'm sure the right. battery technology yeah. has changed tremendously since then, yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. good. Wow. That was a Village Homes book? Yes, it was. Oh, yes, my. it was. I snapped it up. So who <laughs> put it in? That's right. Who put I don't it know. in? I don't know who put it in. So With John, COVID, we'll put... we do a lively business. We have those post book boxes so, all around, and boy, we we circulate our books. So yeah. this is an interesting thing. We have a lot of book boxes around our community, and you know, stimulating the reading about certain topics is an interesting idea. Um, you yeah. know, getting certain topics out into the community that way. So. Yes. Indeed. Yes. Wow. And I want to thank you. John's taken his ID4 to uh, several of our EV shows we've had. So yeah. I think, I think John, you might've had the car that I trailed when I first saw the, the VW ID4 on the road. I was coming That's right. down That's and right. I was like, uh, my daughter was in the car. She goes, you're stalking that guy in the car. <laughs> you know, I got to find out where he lives. That's right. I was That's driving. Right. I was like, where is that? I got to find that guy. And so I finally begged off. It's okay. okay. Yeah. But thanks for yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> And it was John. It, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was John. Yep. Oh, and I could have told you. <laughs> yeah. The other, the other thing to note is that I sold my BMW i3 to my nephew. <clears throat> so um, now he is driving electric back and forth to school. So, yep. Yeah. Oh, so who had the Rivian? Who had the Rivian? That was Matt. Um, he didn't. He uh, off, exited just off. a little bit. Well, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. So, yeah. Um, well, get his email. You know what? Well, we have his show. email because he signed <laughs> up. So, yeah. this is a trick. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> right. Barbara has her hand in the air, or my, maybe it's Robert. It's 
it's got to be Robert. That's Barbara. We can't hear you, Barbara, if you're or Robert, if you're talking. Well, maybe you're leaving the thing. Bye. Hello. Hello. All right. All right. Now we got you. All right. Can you, and you can hear me okay? Yes. Yes. All right. Very good. Robert and I didn't put the camera on because I haven't had a shower or washed my hair in five days for <gasps> reasons that I um, won't go into. But um, I assure you that we, we have been hanging on your every word this evening. Um, so <laughs> Robert and I have a Nissan Leaf. It's six years old. It gets about a hundred miles to a full charge. We probably do 90% of our driving on it. Um, if we need to go very far, we take Robert's ancient um, ice car. So we want to ditch his car so that we can be an all electric family. We want a car that has at least 300 miles on a full battery, hopefully you know, more like 350. Um, Robert says, let's just go out and spend all, all of our retirement money on a Tesla. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, wait, lots of high mileage cars are surely going to be coming on the market in the next few years. But in the meantime, you know, if we have to go very far, we're driving on gas. So what, what do you all think? Would it be better to, um, to just lay out money for a Tesla or some other high priced car that's currently available with high mileage or wait a couple of years? Oh, I'm going to say Katrina, um, Katrina. <laughs> Do you have some wisdom for us? Uh, sorry, I was reading my email. Talking about looking at a 300, I have a lot of emails. 350 mile, uh, th mile range, Tesla versus anything else is what I'm hearing. Yeah, how long do we have to wait before there's much besides Tesla to choose from? Well, we're getting close. Um, the other question is, are you looking for form factor or anything? Are you wanting to be SUV? pickup, sedan, hatchback, like what's your Yeah, shape? pretty much any anything with a hatchback that we could use, misuse, like a truck, like we do our leaf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the leaf is pretty diverse. So you really, you got the, I'm impressed with all you've done with your leaf uh, yeah. <laughs> in yeah. a good way. Um, well, you, yeah. I was just going to say, there's a couple of angles too. So the newer cars, like, like the VW ID4, charge at a much higher rate too. So even it might have a range that's not 350, you can still, you know, I mean, who's gonna drive 300 miles, 50 miles straight? Right. You could, you could Good you point. Know, take a stop, plug it in. I forget what the VWs was. It was, it was a pretty fast charge rate from, was it 10 to 80%? But even yes, if it, it doesn't work. So I think that's a lot of things in some of the newer cars is they have these much faster charge rates on them. So. Yeah. In the 150 to, well, you know, John and I did 150 to almost 300, I think. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the point I would make is um, um, with my car, I can drive maybe 220 miles at uh, maybe 250 even. But uh, if, if I drive for like an hour and a half or two hours, I need to stop. <laughs> to pee or to eat or drink or something. And uh, so why not, why not charge? Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. okay, fair, fair point. And you like your ID for? Very much, yep. Yep, I, I, I never considered getting a Tesla. I like supporting uh, Volkswagen um, for several reasons, actually, yeah. And I think you got free charging from Electrify America. That's right, that's right. I charge down at the Bank of America. I've charged there for a whole year now. And there's Electrify America stations proliferating all over the country. And let me add, I'm not 
promoting VWs, and I take no money from VW. But huh, neither neither do I. <laughs> like they took money from you. Yeah, but anyway, that's something to think about, Barbara. Is uh, some of the newer ones that charge really quick. So. Yes, um, I hadn't really uh, considered that. So it it just seems like amazing new cars might be coming out in the next year or two, maybe things that we don't even know about. It's, um, it's like in the old days, if you bought a computer, um, you kept waiting for innovation to settle down so mm -hmm. that your computer wouldn't immediately be outmoded. And it, you know, it, it never did really. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if EVs are gonna be like that. I don't think so. Um, when I bought my ID, when I bought my BMW i3, there weren't many choices, but now there are many choices, and there are some excellent cars available now. And if you had cold feet, you could always lease it, and then decide in three years whether it was worth it or not. Whether there's something better, much better. But oh, yeah. hadn't thought of that. I've um, I've never leased a car before. But yeah, I have friends who leased a um, fuel cell vehicle, and at at the end of the lease, they just turned it in. There, there just weren't enough places to charge it. Yeah. yeah. Or fill it. Yes. So Barbara Richards started off tonight by telling us about the price cut in the Bolt for I think it's next year. Is that right, Richard? Right. Yeah. yeah. Which and is uh, July first is when it's and, first production. Lynn has a bolt. I think she probably misuses it also, doesn't she? <laughs> hmm. You have a hatchback on the bolt, right, Lynn? Yes. Yeah. What do you mean, what do you mean misuse? I don't know. Boy, oh, I was... Well, I, I said uh, we use our leaf like a truck. Uh, <laughs> the, the interior looks like it, but it's, it's amazingly roomy and capable. Yeah, we just need need to be able to haul freight with it, sort of. So, sure. Um, sure. and the bolts are all hatchbacks. Is that correct? Yes. yes. All right. Okay, that that's a possibility. Yeah. I I remember um, Chris at one of the very first. Um, uh, National Electric Drive Week thingies that Robert and I participated in. I was sitting there manning the refreshment booth for the volunteers. <laughs> I remember <here>. that one. <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, a guy walked by and uh, was talking to someone uh, about the bolt. And I stopped him and said, you know, I'm 72 years old. I have never bought a car that wasn't a Japanese car. I have an allergy to American cars mm. because mm. when I was growing up, they, they were um, so unreliable and expensive compared to the Japanese cars. So even now the idea of buying an American car is kind of horrifying to me, but this guy said, nope, the, the bolt was done from the ground up, uh, not with the uh, typical earlier approach to car designs. And he said, I think it's really solid. So it, it would be kind of a leap of faith for me to not buy a Japanese car, but, um, uh, but at least according to this guy, they were very sound. Yeah, so the only thing I'd add to this, Barbara, too, is um, there's a number of cars that are coming on the market um, in 2023. And that's when they're having the 2024 models. So Chevy's starting to come out with a whole line. So they have their bolt, but they're really planning this thing called, they have these, a new line of batteries, Opt Optimum, is that what it was? Oh, Ultimum, Ultimum batteries. Um, so it's supposed to be the best thing. It's more um, manageable in that you can, you can change the shape of the battery. It doesn't have to be one flat panel. It can be stacked. And, um, so those are all coming on 2023. Um, and like John was saying too, the Bolt EV and EUV, EUV is a little bit longer, a bit soft to ride. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be coming out. I think production starts like July 1st. So you're going to start seeing them in 
probably August, September. Those will be there. Um, let's see. Um, the, uh, Hyundai Ionic 5. My wife and I took a test ride of that. Amazingly comfortable. Back seat, amazingly roomy. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a fun car. It was a, still a fun car to drive. Um, so the amazing thing about this is I still remember having <laughs> one of my first cars, which was a Dodge Colt Mitsubishi. And uh, it weighed nothing. If I'd never gotten into an accident, it was a death trap. But, um, <laughs> but it weighed nothing. It had this great engine. So, you know, I don't think my zero to 60 time was, I don't know if it ever hit 10 seconds. Maybe it was nine. I think, I think that was just one nine. But, uh, you know, and you get these EVs now. I mean, they're around seven, seven, eight in the seconds to zero to 60. So, um, but it's also instantaneous. So there's so much fun to drive. Well, you know, because you drive your leaf. Uh -huh. Which yeah. is remarkably peppy, uh, peppier than any of my little Japanese subcontract uh, compact cars for yeah. sure. So I'm going to do a shout out to Katrina. So Katrina, um, not all of you know, but she uh, has was a graduate stu student, undergrad, and then a graduate student, and has been volunteering with Cool Davis and Saki V for lots of years, and now she works for the state. Um, uh, not the state, but uh, um, Both. <laughs> work, yes, working on uh, electric vehicle planning for um, uh, around trucks. And mm -hmm. um, but she's about to go to a conference and give a paper in Norway. And that's really cool. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I, I work for a nonprofit called CalStart um, and I work in kind of the heavy duty, the mostly buses, a little bit of trucks, just, you know, anything to try to decarbonize our transportation space. And uh, yeah, so on Friday, I'm leaving out of SFO to go to Norway to present some research about um, bus heating. So um, very niche, but I'm absolutely <laughs> in love with um, that. If you guys want to talk about heating battery electric buses, I'm happy to talk about that. <laughs> oh, and so and she did post her master's thesis. awake at night. <laughs> yeah, right? it's just so fun. <laughs> I think it's really cool. I interviewed a bunch of people. Yeah, and I yeah, I put my master's thesis. If y'all want to talk about workplace charging or charging management strategies, like we were talking about with SEMA Connect. Um, Happy to talk your ear off about that. Um, I'm going to take a bunch of pictures so I can report back from Norway. But uh, yeah, so I, I, my my ancestry is Norwegian, and I've I've been to Norway several times. Uh, I think Norway is leading the world in adoption of electric vehicles. Yes. Yeah, it really is. I've been to, I was in Oslo maybe ten years ago now. Um, and I'm going back and I'm very excited, but yeah, I'm really excited to see all the cars and the, the electric vehicles. I think they're at like a 80%. I don't know. It's a big number. There's a lot of electric vehicles there and yeah. I'm really excited to see the ones that aren't here, like in the state. So you've got your ID four. So I think they'd be doing some test drives. So, you know, the ID three and mm -hmm. the, um, I really hope they have the, uh, what is it? The mini the VW van, oh, the buzz, buzz, the buzz, buzz. yeah, um, and you know some of the other vehicles that haven't haven't or are not going to be making it to the states. I think will be really really fun to check out and touch. <laughs> so, so, Katrina, I'm glad you mentioned buses. Um, I should have put this in the front announcements, but uh, the first couple of Unitrans electric buses should be hitting the streets this summer. They're testing them now. Yeah, that's what I heard from Jeff is um, there. They got a couple of I think they got three new flyer electric buses in and they're touching them and poking them and, you know, doing what they have to do. And so um, I talked to you know, Jeff last year, I think it was about when you get these, we need to plan some events where we get some people on buses just because it's it's a fun and different experience. And so uh, we're going to be looking to do that um, and uh, to get leadership and and sort of pull people in who are just not familiar with electric vehicles and get them to experience this um, so look forward to some maybe some fun bus experiences in the next Buses several months are incredibly fun and actually what i was thinking about for other projects i was uh, at a different ride and drive event actually um, and the other benefit of bringing a bus is besides the fact that it's big and you notice a bus um, you can also run the air conditioning in the bus. So when it's seven gazillion degrees outside, 
like it happens to be in Davis sometimes, you can sit in the air conditioned bus. <laughs> so you can park it somewhere and, you know, talk about a bus, but also not like die of a heat stroke. <laughs> a, a few years ago, uh, some of the musicians in our community were talking with us about having some music on the bus experiences where we kind of like had parties. Mm. We had these like party celebrations on the bus, party but it was bus. like all about getting people to ride the bus. But now it's, but I think having an electric bus to ride will be even be more attractive. So thinking about how we bring them to neighborhoods and engage different mm -hmm. parts of the community with them would be fun. Mm -hmm. so you're thinking on those hot days, we could turn the bus into a cooling center with its own music, live <laughs> music in the back. Right? Mm -hmm. I like that. I like it. <laughs> yeah. It would be good. So Katrina, yeah. vans, you much on vans? Uh, just that depends on the class. Yeah. Oh, the I tell you why, because Ken's bike and ski. Yeah, we and, were talking about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. Ken's looking, you know, he wants for his bike shop because he says he does a lot of electric bikes and regular bike deliveries all over the city. You'd love to have something that's kind of a, you're not a giant delivery van, but I think. Yeah, of the, the Ford Transit for van. Um, yeah. Ford is making an electrified one where they're actually using, um, they're doing it themselves. Um, and so that should be fun. I don't know the pack size of that. It's probably like 100 or so, I would guess 100 kilowatt hours or so, which will give you uh, that size of vehicle is probably one to one. So maybe like 80 to 100 miles of range, which I think is plenty for Davis. Um, sure. and there's, as Chris just pointed out, there's plenty of charging in the city. So, um, I know Ken's, I actually have to go to Ken's. I need them to fix my bike, but, um, <laughs> I haven't made it out there yet. Uh, but I know there's not a lot of charging in that area. There's a, right. That, cause they're over by the, um, co-op co -op. is there, co there's yeah. nothing well, at the co-op. There really should be. Yeah. Well, but, but, you know, uh, uh, so the D, the DC fast is right down at Bank yeah, America. Yeah. Well, so, so the. The interesting part about um, the Ford Transit van, well, the Ford Transit van is fine because that's like a class two, I think. It's a smaller van, but the interesting part when you start looking at vans <clears throat> is um, how you can public charge them because they're so much larger. And a lot of the infrastructure right now is set up for light duty vehicles. So you physically cannot park a van or you know a semi truck in some of these locations, uh, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. And sometimes also it's just... Um, physically like the cord length isn't long enough unless you you know back it in across like four different parking spots to get it to fit you know based on the port mm -hmm. location which, which uh, when we start to look at especially some of our bigger parking lots that are and there's a whole bunch of businesses there that might in the future have electric delivery um yeah. we should be looking at uh, having parking space having charging specifically for that kind of delivery vehicle and making sure that it's planned for in those spaces. Yeah, so a mm. lot doesn't, I'm not sure kind of what needs to be done. I can give you some recommendations, but you know, kind of just making sure there's enough turning radius for a big vehicle like that. Um, I have very strong opinions about port locations in vehicles. Um, so like, like the Bolt, I really like how it's in like the front driver's side of the vehicle, the Leaf is in the front, but a lot of the newer vehicles, I, John, you can tell me better than I can. John, not this John, the other, uh, you know, where the ID4's location is. I think it's on the back. The Ionic is on the back. Um, it's on the back. On yeah, the back. on the back. And the, the I3 was on the back as well. And I personally don't like that. I think it makes it really hard to, if you have to back into spaces, especially in a public lot where you're not so comfortable with it, um, or if there's a lot of just like movement of vehicles. Um, my dad just got the Ionic 5. And I had to back it into the Electrify America stations by Ikea because I'm in West Sac. Um, terrible. There was a few Ford Fusion who was very pushy. And I was like, please just let me back into my parking spot. Um, he was not happy with me. Uh, and I backed up wrong. It was this whole situation. Anyway, um, I really don't think that's a good port location um, for me personally. Um, but if people are used to it, you know, maybe you have a long enough cord installed in your garage. Or no, you don't, you don't public charge, you public charge, sorry. You know, if you have if you're used to it, the Bank of America stations are not that busy generally, from what I can tell. Um, I'm used to it. I have plenty of time. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, it might not work for other people. I don't know. That's just my opinion. Um, and I don't know where the Ford Transit van um, port location is um, off yeah. the top of my head. Sorry, I don't have that memory. But maybe <laughs> they'll learn like something from the Bolt, right? Uh, I think yeah. uh, the, the Mustang. So actually, I would allege that it's probably in the front. The Mach-E, the Mustang is in the front. I think the Lightning is in the front. Eh, I'm not sure. I don't know where the Lightning is. I could see it mm -hmm. in either place. Um, but there 
are um, just little things like that that I get picky about that you know nobody cares about. Uh, but yeah, the Ford Fanjet van I would say for Ken's is probably sufficient enough. It has you know enough headroom. It's probably what he uses now or something similar. So it's not totally unusual um, or like, you know, kind of a hard switch, you know, which can be hard for people sometimes. Um, I'm intrigued by him asking because I, I do think um, it would be, it would serve us well as these new vehicles are coming out to do a special event that is about delivery trucks and, and um, a business use of electric vehicles and and just to have a special event where we focus on the business community and what options especially something have. local too so yeah. it's not just you know somebody coming in from the middle of nowhere to talk about what it's like in la and i'm like you don't speak to me we are not la <laughs> um, but you know we've got the farmers mar all the farmers market vendors and you know we are in our small business community in downtown davis and and uh, the chamber and uh, come you know combining an event for all of those groups um like and holding it like at the farmers market and um and featuring the vehicles for them everybody to see would be fun so so katrina when you're in norway i just remember when i was talking to ken about this too i looked it up so the Volkswagen, I think it's the ID Buzz, right? There's yeah, the Buzz. van. Yeah. They actually are going to do a cargo van based on that. I'm um, so ready. Bring yeah. So look it up. But the last thing I looked was, it's not coming to America. Not wow. coming to the U.S. But it's supposed to be the same size, and they're just not putting the windows inside. And so when you're there, find out, and then ask them, would you mind sending me one just to look at it? Send it to send it to West Sacramento. Yeah, just I got this. Just drop yeah. it in there. It's fine. But it, it looks like the perfect thing for one of these local delivery vans too. So yeah. yeah, it should be really cool. But actually, what I'm really excited about um, is Rivian put. You guys heard they put in their service center in West Sac, and I'm like, I live there. Like, I want to see it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's. I think it's pretty good location because you know it's right by Davis. It's right by Sac. Um, so I'm really excited that that's floating around too. You could probably make a fun um, use case out of the. The Rivian, if you can get a hold of them, <laughs> if it's in your price range, yeah. not in my budget. But Rivian makes a sedan too, right? I haven't seen any, but yes, they do make a. Uh, no, they no. make a uh, SUV. Sorry, not a. Sedan. Oh, SUV. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, we're at seven thirty-one, and uh, it's been a great conversation. I'm glad everybody could join nice. us tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here. That was good. Now we can turn oh. on the basketball. Game. I will read this book and send a book report. Oh, <laughs> thank you, John. John we look forward. <laughs> yeah, John, I've got you down for the next meeting for the book reporting because Katrina down for her travel log and okay, know, what happened in Norway. So <laughs> okay, we want to know why why those cars are not coming to the U.S. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Why don't we they want them? Cars here. <laughs> Gosh, crash, yeah. crash testing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's you. Oh, was okay. that it? Yeah. It's too reasonable, Ash. Don't give me that. What is this? What are you being reasonable about this? Like the desire outweighs the standard. The glass Come isn't on. half empty. The glass isn't half full. It's over designed, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the glass better be full of like, you know, something a little strong because I'm tired and I'm ready. <laughs> and um, when President Biden said that the, that the uh, ma male vehicles should be electric uh, in the future, I think the Volkswagen CEO said, we're going to make some vehicles in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So maybe we can make some, uh, uh, some delivery vehicles there. Wow. Hmm. So maybe that will happen. Yeah, I'm ready. Well, so. Bring it on. They haven't to decided enough. to make them all. They're just talking a small number still. Is that right? I don't know. Like somewhere. we've been bantering around that we want to go way electric, but they still have DeJoy in command, and he's only I think getting he, he's, a few. He's, he's, he's on the way out, I think. Well, that's how it's been talked, but I don't think that it's happening. Well, I hope I, it's on the way out because they I, should I, they should go major electric. My goodness! Yeah, yeah. it's a missed opportunity. You're right. They don't do it. Oh. Yeah, I heard that Biden's got to get his two appointees proposed appointees through the Senate, and once they're appointed, then he's got majority on the board. Oh, that's yeah. He's got to get two. Yeah. 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 Oh. I think that's I think that's happening soon. I hope. Oh. Before yeah. they place the order for the vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. okay. All right, everyone. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And um, we're really glad you could join us. Yep. And now nice we know where you are. Nice meeting, Richard. Thanks. 
Oh, you're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Barbara and Robert. Oh, yep. And you'll want to get that car. You can't wait three years. You'll want it. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah. And it's money. You can't take it with you. Yeah, I think exactly. But if, but if you get yeah. that fancy EV, you can take me with you. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but when we can't afford food, we're going to be eating the upholstery. So yeah. anyway. Yeah. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right. Hey, good night. Good Bye. night. Bye, Happy Bye -bye. Wednesday. Bye-bye. Wait. Let's okay. see. We'll stop the recording. I'm going to go mm -hmm. ahead and do that. There we go.